Доброго дня, Володимире, надзвичайно приємно і це великий привілей для мене перебувати тут разом з тобою на британській землі. І шлях Британії, України, він чітко вказаний, коли вже в нас є 10 тисяч воїнів, які тренуються тут в Британії, і ще більше будуть перебувати далі із... I'm told they're already mastering the art of driving these 62-ton sophisticated weapons, which will soon be making a difference on the battlefield of your country. All over the United Kingdom, Ukrainian men and women are learning how to command and control NATO standard weapons, whether that is in drone warfare, tank operations, or basic training. Their dedication, courage, and determination is a credit to you and your country. And Vladimir, your visit here today underlines our two countries' close and enduring friendship. We will always be by your side, your staunch and unwavering friends. We both know the people of Ukraine's incredible strength and inspiring bravery will ultimately defeat tyranny. That is why we are training and arming them with the equipment they need to push back Russian forces. And as I said to you earlier today, we are also accelerating the delivery of our equipment, the equipment of our allies, to ensure that it reaches your front line in coming days and weeks, not months or years. The Ukrainian crews who arrived last week will be using Challenger 2 tanks to defend Ukraine's sovereign territory next month. And I am pleased that today we have agreed that we will expand our training program a program that has trained 10,000 troops in the last six months alone to your Marines and fighter jet pilots, ensuring the armed forces of Ukraine are able to defend their country for generations to come. We must arm Ukraine in the short term, but we must bolster Ukraine for the long term. Your country cannot be left vulnerable to attack ever again. Today we have signed the London Declaration, further deepening our cooperation, and in the coming days we will mark a year since this needless and unprovoked invasion, and Russia will see more than ever that their tactics are only solidifying Western resolve, only convincing us to go further and faster to help you, Vladimir, and we will. After all, you told me last week that collective International unity is your greatest weapon, and you can be sure that we will deliver on that, not just now, but long into the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Prime Minister. Shalomne. Dear Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, dear journalists, dear participants, all the British, today together with Mr. Prime Minister, we are putting the final touches on our negotiations. And this is exactly here on this military base where our Ukrainian wars are undergoing their training. And we began this day with some defense issues together with the Rishi. And then obviously we also continue discussing this defense issues in my address to the British Parliament. And we are closing this day again with the defense issues. We have a very strong defense package uh, from Great Britain. We've already received some significant number of armored vehicles and we've agreed on uh, the uh, uh, longer range missiles and also the training of our uh, avi AVA warriors with regards to uh, managing the unmanned vehicles. And I believe that together we will cover this uh, difficult path to our common victory. And of course, to get today I'm not able to share with you all of the details what we've been talking about and how it is specifically we're going to strengthen Ukraine. However, I would like to say that this day has become very fruitful and I'm grateful to Prime Minister for understanding our needs and for his helpful advice and for the decisions that are truly helping our Ukrainian warriors to become stronger. I'm also grateful 
to His Majesty for uh, the opportunity to have a meeting and conversation with him. And I'm grateful to all of the members of the British Parliament who today during my address clearly showed that Great Britain will never betray their brave spirit. I'm also grateful to everyone in the United Kingdom who was today standing with Ukrainian flags in London and we saw that we noticed as we were passing by and thank you for your support and today it is very clear that we are standing together with Great Britain uh, together with the Prime Minister we signed declaration of unity a document that truly records principles of our interaction and mutual support and this is truly a different a new level of our relations we also emphasized uh, the achieved level of support, whether it's in security, sanctions, political and economical cooperation, something that truly strengthens our both countries. We've also discussed our position on the international uh, platform. My deep gratitude to Rishi and all of uh, Great Britain uh, for your readiness and willingness to work with us in executing the Ukrainian peace formula. And I also would like to thank all of our Ukrainian warriors, whether it's every soldier, sergeant, officer or general. Our state is doing and will be doing to make sure that on the front line we have everything in the maximum, maximum that's owned by other um, leading countries. Ukraine will be among those countries who has everything to defend their people. Glory to everyone fighting for Ukraine. Many thanks to everyone who helps Ukraine. Again, thank you, Rishi. Thank you to all the people in Great Britain. Thank, thank you for all this 350 days of unity. Glory to Ukraine. I think we have some time for a few questions from the media. Can we start with ITV News? Is there someone here? Thank you. Hello, uh, Rohit Khatri from ITV. Um, Mr. President, first of all, you, you've made a broad and emotional appeal today for further support. But I think a lot of British people want to know some of the specifics. For example, when do you believe this Russian offensive will happen? How many fighter jets do you need? When do you need them? And what happens if you don't get them? And to you, Mr. Prime Minister, you seem to be inching towards a position of being able to provide fighter jets towards the Ukraine, for the Ukrainians. Can, can you offer absolute clarity here and now? Will they get them? And if so, when? Thanks, uh, Rohit, for the question. Why don't I start yeah, and then uh, I'll do that a little bit. So, the, look, for, first of all, look, we've been very clear and we've been clear for a long time that when it comes to the provision of military assistance to Ukraine, nothing is off the table. And that's because we're determined to ensure that Vladimir, the president and his people can be victorious against Russian aggression. And we've backed up that rhetoric with action. Last year, behind the United States, we were the single largest donor of military equipment to Ukraine. And we said that we would match or exceed that amount, almost two and a half billion pounds again this year. And you saw when it came to the provision of main battle tanks. We were the first G7 nation. I announced that weeks ago, something that the President and I had discussed previously. It was important in order to ensure that Ukraine could make progress on the battlefield. And I think we helped lead an international conversation, which led to many other countries following us and providing main battle tanks to Ukraine. So when it comes to fighter combat aircraft, of course, they are part of the conversation. Indeed, we've been discussing that today and have been previously. And that's why we've announced today that we will be training Ukrainian Air Force on NATO standard platforms. Because the first step in being able to provide advanced aircraft is to have soldiers or air aviators that are capable of using them. That is a process that takes some time. We've started that process today. That's because we're keen to support the President and his country in delivering a victory. And nothing is off the table. And our leadership on this issue is something that we all collectively should be very proud of. And I know that the President is grateful for. 
Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. With regard to the equipment, with the equipment that we need, of course, there's a lot of equipment we need and a lot of different equipment. It all depends on the situation, depends on the situation on the battlefield, on the di kind of in the d military direction, but also depends on what's happening within uh, the country. You know how we are fighting against the Iranian drones. You know, there are hundreds and thousands of them and um, and we are fighting against them by various means and that includes also our ballistic missiles because these unmanned vehicles, these Iranian drones, they hit uh, civilian infrastructure, educational infrastructure, hospitals, schools, uh, civilians, you know, because they are trying to threaten Ukrainians, but they're trying to make them flee, but Ukrainians are not going to flee because that is why when we talk about this, we do need air defense systems and we are grateful to everyone who is providing them and that also um, when we have those systems that allows people to go to work and work and every and once we once people work obviously this money they all not just go to for pensions or other social welfare, but also this also goes to support our warriors. That's why it's very important that we have everything needed to support people in their jobs. And when we talk about the battlefield, what are our priorities? Of course, armored vehicles. You know, we know that our enemy has got thousands units of armored vehicles, you know, back from the, uh, back from the Soviet Union heritage. And of course, NATO armored vehicles, they are the best. And yet there are only a few of them, you know, when you only have 10 NATO armored vehicles against a thousand of Soviet armored vehicles? Well, what are the chances, you know? And we have no way out. We have to stand firm. We need armored vehicles. We need tankers. We need flighter jets and obviously we've spent a lot of time talking about this together and you've just heard what uh, Mr. Prime Minister has already mentioned, and even uh, today and tomorrow we will be meeting with the EU leaders and discussing these uh, issues and also uh, longer range missiles. That's our priority. And I'm very grateful that Britain has finally heard us in that regard. And I do hope that other countries will also hear us when it comes to longer range missiles, you know, because we do need to push back the Russians so people can just live. And as to the offensive, you know what, what can I say? Frankly, we live in the state of war. What can I say here? We cannot be just thinking about the offensive. The offensive has never happened, you know. It's just been a different kind of intensity. So all we need to think is that let us make Russians think about Ukrainian counteroffensive, okay? They need to be thinking about this. They need to be thinking how they should be leaving our territory. That's all I would like to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, next, can I call on BBC Ukraine? Uh, greetings, uh, Mr. President. I would really like to hug you, but uh, I'm not allowed. Why not? Please, do give me a hug, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Could, uh, my question is to you, Mr. Sunak. I, uh, you know that Ukrainian soldiers, they are dying every day. Don't you think that that decision about warplanes is taking too long? And, uh, yeah, and the other question is, what are, are your steps uh, to clear the reputation of London as a city that is still laundering Russian money? Thank you. So with, I think you heard from the President's previous answer, Natalia, about the very immediate needs, and that's air defense and long-range missiles. And that's the conversation that we've been having most recently about how can we provide air defense to protect the Ukrainian population. That has been the thing that we've talked about probably most in all of our conversations, which is why we've provided 
thousands of surface-to-air missiles and air defence systems, and will continue to do so, and more are coming over the next few weeks. And as the President said, probably the most crucial capability right here and now is main battle tanks, which we led on, but also those long-range missiles. Uh, that, I think that and all the, the, the talking that we've done and the planning for how we can have decisive victory on the battlefield and make progress, it requires long-range missiles, which currently the range is not there. And again, that's the conversation that we've been having. And again, we hope that Britain can lead. But when it comes to protecting soldiers, I think we, we, we feel very acutely the tragedy and the hardship that your country and your country uh, men are going through. And I, you know, we've both had the privilege of meeting some of them today. I've met some of them in the past. And their bravery is inspiring. It's awe-inspiring to see, as I have, you know, the ordinary citizens, young, young men and women who are fighting to defend their country and being trained to do so here. Uh, and they go with not just our wishes and our training, but they go with our full support with all the equipment that we can continue to provide them and will continue to do so. But rest assured, we are here with you, with your people, and continue to provide you with whatever we can to ensure their safety and, indeed, their success. Thank you. And with regard to sanctions, I think we've, as you, as you saw at the beginning of this conflict, I used to be the finance minister, and we put in place, as the President talked about it earlier today, probably the most extensive and forward-leaning sanctions package of any country at the beginning of this conflict to demonstrate very clearly that Russia's aggression was unacceptable and we would punish them in every which way we could. Uh, we've announced further sanctions today, but continually when it comes to sanctions, uh, we have, I think, led. Uh, and you remember the conversations we had on, on things like SWIFT and banks right at the beginning of this uh, conflict. Again, it was Britain that led the way in pushing for very strict sanctions. And, and we, as I said, we've announced further today. And wherever we can continue you know, to tighten them and do more, we will look to do so, uh, as we have done today. Uh, next, uh, can we go to Sky News, please? Thank you. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News. Prime Minister, if I could ask you first of all, there does seem to have been a, a lag between Ukraine asking for more sophisticated weaponry and it eventually being given. They asked for more advanced artillery. It was eventually sent. They've asked for tanks and they will be sent eventually. They now want fighter jets and we're training their pilots, but we're not sending the jets. Your predecessor, one of your predecessors, a close friend of President Zelensky, has, has wondered why we're not doing more. Why not send more so they can finish off the job now? What is holding the West back? Why is there that lag? Uh, Mr. President, good to see you again. If I could ask you about fighter jets, how urgently do you need them? And what does it mean for your country if you don't get them? So, I mean, I'll, I'll take that as the first question. And again, I, I probably the, the, the notion of the question, because I think we have continually led, actually, in the UK with the provision of equipment to Ukraine, and whether it was right at the beginning with anti-tank missiles, whether, as you heard from the President, the importance of armoured vehicles, I think we've sent hundreds, uh, whether it's artillery guns, again, in the next few weeks, a new set of batteries of our artillery guns will arrive, uh, tanks we've already talked about, and we're training combat aircraft for the first time. Uh, indeed, actually something that we should have probably been doing a long time ago, because we have a long-standing training relationship with Ukraine that predates the war. Uh, but that is something, as we look forward, we'll want to continue to do more of, as we want to make sure that the Ukrainian uh, armed forces are trained on NATO standard equipment, and there's greater interoperability between Ukraine uh, and NATO, which is very much something that we've been discussing. So I think actually we've continued to be on the forward leading edge of it and we're providing things as quickly as we can. The, 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 the challenge of tanks are going to be on the battlefield, as I said, in a matter of weeks. I mean, you've seen uh, the Ukrainian soldiers are being trained on them as fast as we can and we're providing them as fast as we can and we know that they will, they will make a difference. And I think the President would tell you, you know, we, we've been having conversations for the few months that I've had this job and relatively rapidly after we d discuss what is necessary, you know, Ukraine sees that we do respond and then we galvanise others to respond too. That's what we have done and that's what we'll continue to do.
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to be honest with you here. In the uh, history of this war, there are several pages, and one uh, of these pages, so in fact, even uh, sections, maybe in this war, has been a um, very special section uh, for um, uh, for our warriors and also Great Britain providing uh, equipment and uh, here we're talking about German lines as well and uh, then our people had to rise up and they had to fight with what they had you know we are not we are not we're not doing any self pitying here okay what they had they were doing and we were just grateful to for whatever we were getting and then we turned another page you know and then we turned into uh, we we all turned into fury because Russians were just killing and murdering uh, people and they were raping people and we were ready to have anything and use any kind of weapons just to destroy them. And then we turned another page, artillery. You know, we needed artillery. We, uh, we needed to work in a different direction and this is exactly where we received uh, some help and support. Uh, for example, uh, in certain uh, places, obviously, Great Britain helped us a lot, but when it comes to High Mars, we got a lot of help from the U.S., and we are really grateful to them for this page in the history of uh, war. Be, that it's, I, I think it's very important to understand that Russia has no pity for their own people. They just keep on throwing their people into the battlefield. You know, worse, we have pity. And we protect our people. We would not throw them just onto the battlefield. We needed to prepare them. And that, that kind of marked a different stage in the war. And now we've come to kind of this stagnation phase. You've just asked me uh, what would happen if we don't get this uh, fighter jets or the longer range missiles or we don't have enough uh, ammunition or because everything obviously is, you know, running out and um, coming out of maintenance. Uh, if you don't have this 185 artillery, you know, there will be stagnation. These people will be coming and be living on our territory, and this will pose great risk to all of the world because they've just now they've captured a nuclear station, and they just live there, you know. They, and this kind of risk will be everywhere because they are terrorists. That, and so without the weapons that we are discussing now and the weapons that we just discussed with uh, Rishi earlier today and how Britain is going to help us, you know, all of this is very important. Without this, there will be stagnation, which will not bring to anything good. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Inter. Uh, good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. Dobro večer, Pane Prezidente. Ja pisle press konferenci do vas pidi du. Bude ne čas nekše je zalušit. I will come and see you after the press conference because I would like to get a hug as well. Uh, okay, so you've already summarized. Uh, you've already summarized your day today, and yet I am very interested in your personal impressions. You know, obviously, uh, you've hardly spent even a handful of days outside of uh, Ukraine. You know, in a different uh, country just under the peaceful sky. So what are your personal impressions? And what threatens me back at home? Uh, you know, yes, this is my second visit outside of Ukraine after the beginning of the uh, Russian invasion. And you know what? I had to do two important uh, things. And first of all, I had to express our deep gratitude, deep gratitude of all the Ukrainian people, to the people of Great Britain, to the government of Great Britain, to everyone who had been helping us to keep our land, to make sure that we don't lose it, because this is our land, which is dear to us. And you know, I think it's amazing that Great Britain has been so active in this fight. And truly, I am grateful. 
Uh, we, sh we should not be forgetting everything what we've gone through all of these months. At any point, we could have lost our independence, and yet, and yet, um, all of that time, we haven't had battalions, unfortunately, battalions of friends and allies, but yet we had a very strong unit of friends, partners, allies, and Great Britain has, has, st has stood as our ally and friend here. And I also would like to say that whatever we can do, you know, we should be doing. And this is what I'm, we are trying to do. We are trying to remember who has been with us from the very first day of the war. You know, because we will get this victory, but it just doesn't happen overnight. And, uh, you know, our warriors, our partners, our people, those are the key, kind of the key uh, how would I put it? Probably, you know, those are the key aspects that helped us to be strong and to push back the enemy, yet the war has not ended. And then there is another reason why, why I'm here with this visit, and that's the uh, heavy artillery. And that's why I'm here, you know. I'm here again. We have to do what we can do. We have to come and we talk. We have to talk openly. We have to be frank. I'm a, the president of the country which is fighting now for the independence. And that's why I have to do everything possible to make sure that our partners give everything they can to strengthen us on the battlefield. So those are just two reasons, you know, gratitude and weapons, although, yes, London is a very beautiful city. It's a shame I don't have time for this. And lastly, Harry, uh, the Sun. Thank you, uh, Prime Minister. Um, you say that Britain led the world rightly on training Ukrainian troops, um, on providing arms, and you yourself on tanks, but there does seem to be a reticence to break ranks with the Western allies on jets. Are you personally willing, as Prime Minister, if you can, to send Ukraine some of our typhoon fleet? And, uh, Mr. President, on behalf of millions of Sun readers, I'd just like to say welcome and slava Ukraini. Yes. Boris Johnson says there's no conceivable reason for Britain and the West not to send you jets. What are the reasons that they're telling you privately, and are those reasons credible? Thank you very much, both. Thanks. Uh, so I think you're totally wrong to say that there's been any reticence. Uh, actually, we, we were the first G7 country to provide main battle tanks. We were also the first country to provide serious arms to Ukraine at, at the beginning. And we, we have genuinely led other countries, and that's something we should all be very proud of. And when it comes to the quantum of our support, second only to the United States last year, and again, a commitment to provide the same or more this year. Uh, and then there's also, as well as the, the things that we provide, there's also the, and I think the President would attest to this, the very close cooperation and engagement between our teams as to how that Ukraine can be successful with all the support and training as you're seeing here, but also the help that we provide across the board. So I don't think there's been any reticence at all, actually, and we've probably been the most forward-leaning country in trying to bring about a Ukrainian victory in this conflict. And that's why, as Prime Minister, we decided to change our strategy to accelerate and intensify the amount of support that we give Ukraine so that we can bring about more decisive victory in a sooner period of time. And that's why uh, we, I made the decision to provide tax. And with regard, with regard to aircraft, as I said, we've already said nothing is off the table. And the first step on that has to be to have uh, uh, people who can fly what are very sophisticated pieces of kit. I mean, from start, if you take someone who's brand new for a fighter jet, as, as Vladimir would also say, it takes three years. Now, obviously, that's not what we're working with because Ukraine has existing fighter pilots. Um, but we do need to make sure that they can operate the aircraft that they could potentially be using. But also, there's a supply chain around such sophisticated aircraft. Those are the conversations that the President and I are having and making sure that we understand all the supply chain needs that go along, alongside aircraft like that, making sure that they can be used and used safely and kept safely. So we're having that conversation. And it's also a conversation we are having with our allies, because particularly some of the aircraft that we have are, are done through joint treaty with multiple other countries. And I think we've, we've seen that with previous bits of kit that have, others have had to 
to give. For aircraft, that is something that we are, we are also involved in because we have, as I said, there are other allies involved in the provision of those bits of equipment. And as the President said, he's on his way uh, to Europe after this to pick up this conversation with our partners and allies over there. Uh, but where we can, throughout this conflict, we have been nothing but out in front, and proud, proudly so. And I know the difference that it's making, and I'm, I know the President is grateful for it, and that's what we will continue to do. Uh, truly, truly, I am grateful. And again, even today, once again, I heard from Mr. Prime Minister the desire to provide fighter jets, and officially he declared that we, they can begin training our pilots. And again, not also, when it comes to uh, typhoons, not everything depends just on the decision of uh, Great Britain. And I will be working in that direction uh, because, again, this is how we are changing and how we have been able to change many things. We are intensifying our diplomacy, and I do believe just within a day we will be able to meet uh, with a dozen of EU leaders, and then we'll go back home because it's, this is obviously very important. We w Obviously, all of these conversations, they have to be taking place quickly. And uh, again, uh, when it comes to typhoon, you know, I didn't even, I didn't even know that it takes three years to train a pilot like that. You know, come on, we will be sending you pilots who've already trained for two and a half years, you know. of it is the conversation we're having on long-range missiles, where again, the conversation that we're having is one that is, I think, out in front of other allies about making sure Ukraine has the longer range capabilities that it needs at this phase of the battle. Uh, and that's a very productive conversation that, that we're having today as well. Good. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your questions. Thank you.